And welcome back to the Exxon One and All. I am Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send me an email, and I do love getting your emails, whether they're the seedy kind, which are the majority at times, depends on who the guest is, or the, the enlightened ones that I get when we talk about New Age stuff, or from you aliens out there. And I don't mean the ones that are on their way from Guatemala up to, uh, up to the U.S. border. I'm talking about the ones from outer space. Yes, I use my decoder ring to understand what you're talking about. Email is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com and all social media sites, xzone at xzone, no, xzoneradiotv. And if you'd like to find out about the programming we have available for you 24-7, 365 on the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. And for the programming on Simul TV, where we have Channel 21, which is the Exxon TV channel, www.simultv.com. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects tonight, Exxon Nation, and that is Egypt. My guest this hour is Chance Gardner. He is an award-winning graphic designer, 3D animator, cinematographer, and editor. After a 20-year career producing motion graphics and on-air promo for major TV networks, including 20th Century Fox, Paramount Studios, and NBC Universal, he retired from television in 2001 to make documentaries. His first documentary, Magical Egypt, became a cult classic and is still in wide circulation around the world. After 15 years, uh, Chance has returned to the Magical Egypt project to, pr uh, to produce the much-anticipated Magical Egypt series 2, which features the iconic personalities from the original Magical Egypt, plus a new generation of researchers and unorthodox thinkers, all united by a common fascination with the unexplained mysteries of the past. The new series is described as a forensic recreation of ancient science through a study of ancient aesthetics. The tagline for the new series is, Where Science Refuses to Go and Where Religion Forbids Us to Look, the artist takes over as the rightful tour guide. His website is MagicalEgypt.com. And Chance Gardner, welcome to the X-Zone. Thank you, Rob. What a pleasure. Uh, the pleasure's all ours, sir. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your broadcasting career. You know, gosh, you, uh, you work for some major, major studios, you know, uh, 20th Century Fox, uh, Paramount, NBC, Universal, and, and retired in 2001. Remember what was happening in 2001 in the States? The States started becoming a scary place, not nearly like it is now, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, I uh, met this character, John Anthony West, while I was working at the networks. We, I w was at the time working on this god-awful uh, Egypt special through Fox, <laughs> and uh, largely fraudulent and idiotic. But I got a chance to meet oh. my hero, John Anthony West, and uh, it changed my life forever. Uh, not necessarily for the better, because uh, once I met John, mm -hmm. I moved to Egypt, and he was like my grateful dad. I just followed him around for a couple of years and videotaped everything that came out of his mouth. And early on, nobody really suspected that he would become such a counterculture icon. You know, at the time, it was just, it was a very obscure subject. And uh, I was just so personally taken with this man that I thought it was a good use of my time. Uh, and, and, you know, the show speaks for itself. It's been out there for a while and it's made the rounds. It's had hundreds of millions of views on YouTube. And, um, uh, you know, in retrospect, I'm very glad that I made the decision, but at the time there was some harrowing. Very hard to walk away from a highly paid job to do something that's in your heart when yeah. you know that there might not be financial reward. You know, I can understand that and I can appreciate that. Uh, my wife and I have gone that through that uh, route many times, but it always works out for the best. When you follow your heart, yeah. it's weird what happens, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. So how magical is Egypt? You know... Um, when I first went to Egypt as an artist, and mm -hmm. especially there with my mentor, John Anthony West. Are you familiar with John Anthony West's work? No, no I'm not. I hate to admit. He, he was a really iconic person. He called himself a rogue Egyptologist, and he was very much against the orthodox idea of ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's some things that are just patently, provably not true, like they only had copper tools to work with, and a lot of our presumptions about the state of technology and right. the state of intelligence, mm -hmm. you know, in the distant world, we're really not getting a completely accurate picture from Orthodox Egyptology. And to your question, one of the things that we're really not getting an accurate picture about is this weird 
ubiquitous presence of magic and sorcery and Mm -hmm. in this incredibly responsible sophisticated meticulous way that blended with biology and it blended with science um egypt was a unique culture because it had such a holistic you know a holistic kind of meta science so there was no psychology that wasn't addressed in archaeology the muse i mean in uh in uh, architecture uh, astrology, astronomy, psychology, theology, we're all kind of blended into this one model. And it's sort of the whole culture is predicated on the exact opposite of what modern culture is, where modern culture will, in modern science, there's this kind of reductionist feeling where consciousness entirely originates in the skull and is just a kind of byproduct of this electrochemical complexity. Whereas in Egypt and in a lot of the ancient world, and in the Eastern world to this day, they believe that consciousness is the only thing there is, and mm-hmm. consciousness can sol- you know, solidifies sort of or slows down light to right. produce mm-hmm. all the material that we see around us. So depending on what model you buy into, Egypt actually either makes no sense at all or it presents itself as this remarkably sophisticated science that does something that modern science can't do. You know, to this day, nobody knows what consciousness is. Nobody knows what your pineal gland actually does. Does you know we know a couple of things, but consciousness is such a mystery, and it is my uh, contention, and it's the contention of the show that what Egypt left behind wasn't this crazy nonsensical proto religion, but it was in fact a very robust and sophisticated science. But it's a science that focuses on something that science in the modern world doesn't focus on, which is the mysteries of consciousness. I believe the Egyptians were uh, more advanced than current history gives them credit for. Would you agree with that? I would agree, and in fact, I've just made an entire documentary saying that exact thing. Wow. If that is the case, why doesn't academia and Egyptology catch up and say, you know what, we've learned this, we've learned that. Wouldn't that enrich the society, the culture, as well as give an entirely new perspective on humanity itself? I believe it's the most important unacknowledged bit of new science that there is. And I have to be very careful because you never, mm-hmm. you know, Egyptology is such a broad word and there's it so is. many Egyptologists out there. Yeah. When I was younger and I was spending time with my mentor, this guy, John Anthony West, he wrote this book and it really did outline all of the new findings and the new models that we have that demonstrate beyond question that they were much more sophisticated than we gave them credit for. And Egypt is full of engineering feats that we literally can't accomplish today. So there's no question that uh, they were smarter. But I watched John spend his whole life banging his head against a wall that was never going to yield for him, which was he kept thinking that he was going to make Egyptology update their views and apologize to him. And there's something systemic in uh, in holding on you know if you're a professor if you're a tenured anybody if you're an expert of any kind and someone else comes along and presents a new model that completely invalidates everything you've spent your life on plus is going to require billions of dollars to reprint history and school books the tendency in a lot of different sciences and this is more a personal thing than a scientific thing that you know territorialism and protecting one's um identity and reputation. And also, Egyptology is a very discreet science. It's actually a humanity and not a science, but it's a, it's a very discreet thing, and it's insular, if you know what I mean. It's very isolated, and one of the things about magical Egypt is we realize we're never, ever going to get anybody from the old school to listen. They say science happens one funeral at a time. I love that. As the old school uh, dies out, there's a new generation of Egyptologists that are completely much more open-minded. And in fact, uh, years ago in Russia, the de facto Russian encyclopedia mentioned John West and this alternate model of Egypt as a viable contender to the orthodoxy. So I don't want to paint anyone with a bad brush or say there's ill intentions, but there does seem to be this systemic resistance to recognizing how smart they were. You know, here we are in the year 2018, and and academia is still brainwashing our our youth with the fact that, or the the misfact, I should say, that Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas. Well, we know that is one of the biggest lies that kids are taught today. And, and, you know, like, what about the Vikings? What about the Irish monks? What about this, that? Well, no, it was Christopher Columbus. Why? Why lie? And if they're lying about this part of history... I can only imagine how many lies are being told and how much fraud is being perpetrated by academia because they don't want to admit they're wrong. And to me, it's a crime. 
It does seem like a crime against humanity. I, I've learned not to rail too much and certainly not accuse anybody of nefarious uh, intentions, but uh, I know from living my life that uh, there is just some things that they're never going to acknowledge. There's an author called Schwaller de Lubix. All right, let's amazing. take a bit of a break here. I've got to oh. take my break at, the, at uh, this time. Chance, great talking to you. Glad you're with us. And like I said, uh, Egypt, one of my most favorite subjects here on the show. And Chance Gardner is our guest. And we'll return on the other side of this break as we continue here from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Now, if you'd like to visit Chance online, his website is MagicalEgypt.com. I'm Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Chance Gardner is my special guest this hour, XO Nation. We're talking about Magical Egypt. And for more information about Magical Egypt, visit Chance's website at www.magicalegypt.com. Chance, what was your most uh, awe-inspiring moment when you were with your mentor in, uh, in Egypt? The thing about Egypt is everywhere you look, when you're with a tour and you mm -hmm. step around a corner to have a pee and you're just standing there looking at a wall, like literally every square inch of Egypt has some undiscovered miracle in them. So I could give you a hundred, but just off the top of my head, um, there is an accurate picture of a sperm cell mm -hmm. in Luxor Temple coming from the phallus. I'll say phallus. That's radio safe, right? Yep, coming from is. issuing forth from the phallus of the god. And it is this anatomically correct uh, sperm cell. Um, one of the contributors to the New Magical Egypt series, Brad Clausen, discovered that in the statuary, there is perfect models and depictions of the human brain. Wow. And in phenomenally uh, sophisticated and accurate way. And not only do they feature these, like um, when you look at the front of a ram and the way the horns yeah. shape and this thing that comes under the ram, it's a perfect depiction of the hemispheres and the brainstem. Not only did they know bio, uh, biologically and biometrically the correct brain, but they also knew what the different brain parts did. So there's um, a lot of, uh, there's several, Edwin Meese, Papyri in particular, shows all these very sophisticated um, medical uh, a collection of medical knowledge about what parts of the brain, like if someone's leg goes limp, here's what part of the brain it is. And there's just this amazing sophistication for which they've never been given credit. And as an artist, what made me excited about it was that it's the art that transmits their science. They didn't really have a linear language like we did. They have this associative web of hieroglyphics and reliefs and symbolism. And it's been mistranslated. And in fact, it is this really robust set of scientific data about the biology of the brain and the emergent property of consciousness. So there seems to be not only schematics of the human brain that are dead on, but right. um, these schematics of consciousness, which is something that uh, is much more rare and unexpected. But where did they get this knowledge from? Well, that's a million-dollar question, isn't it? There's an entire show on TV called Ancient Aliens mm -hmm. that I think takes the easy way out. I would love to find out, and it would sure answer all of those questions about where did they get that technology if we could say aliens did it. But if you think about what we've accomplished in the last 200 years, mm -hmm. you know, when America was starting, when um, you know the Louisiana Purchase yeah. happened, think about our state of uh, – technology then and 200 years 300 years later where we're at the premise of this particular camp is that there well even plato talks about this previous civilization some people call it atlantis uh, lots of different people call it different mm -hmm. names and it's sort of weighed down with a lot of negative baggage but if you give credence to the idea that before history as we know it there was another earlier chapter th that uh might have flourished for thousands and thousands of years uninterrupted. Look at what we've done in 300 years and imagine what we could accomplish in, you know, four or 5,000 years. And then you don't really need aliens uh, to explain the technology. Um, I'm interested in Zechariah Sitchin, and, and there's a big fight about whether Zechariah Sitchin's translations are correct, yes. uh, where he very explicitly talks about it. But most other people that read Sumerian say that he's, you know, that his uh, – 
he's got a, kind of a fanciful uh, translation. So uh, I don't know. And I think if we off- outsource it to aliens, we've really shortchanged ourselves because this is us and this is our human intellect. And uh, I prefer to think that it was just people being smart. Where did their fascination with navigating the afterlife come from? If you understand consciousness correctly, and if you don't happen to buy into the model where consciousness is a one-time thing and it's an accidental phenomenon of the brain, the other, the other, the only other possibility is this idea that Plato talked about, where consciousness is like your relationship to your car. Where imagine if you were still driving the first car you ever bought, isn't it much more fun to think that you have a series of incarnations over which time you're learning these lessons and. I understand it's on thin ice about sounding kind of insane and new agey, but Mm -hmm. if we don't get conditioned too much into the Western way of thinking about things, which is very reductionist and makes us, you know, monkeys in the past and whatever, uh, I think that it's a very optimistic thing to think about, you know, ourselves in this much more intelligent light that we came from geniuses. And if anything, we're a very debased and descended intellect compared to the past rather than this idea of linear progress where we keep getting smarter. Where did all this knowledge go? Oh, well, that's an interesting thing. There's a bunch of different stories, and I'm not here to bash anyone or anything. I understand that, but, and I respect um, that. Uh, there's this thing about conquering Christian armies where mm. – And it's not just Christianity, but just about any power structure has this motivation to erase what came before it. So you see the suppression of the past really active in China right now, in a lot of different countries, even in Australia for some reason because of the Queen's tenuous ownership of Australia. There's a huge, huge pressure to just shut up about this stuff and ignore the past. And so there's a lot of money in religion. There's a lot of money in scientific territorialism. There's it's one of those things. It's hard to point to like that's the culprit. Well. in, in my opinion, a, in my opinion, religion is no longer a religious philosophy. It's a it's a business. You know, the pope is the chairman of the board. The 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 college of cardinals are the directors, and everybody who puts whatever they can into the collection pot are the shareholders. Well, have you ever been to the Vatican? Uh, no, I would get thrown out. Either that, or I get struck by lightning. <laughs> You burst into flames. When oh, you yeah, yeah. In. <laughs> and, you know, I, I know I'd be in trouble because I'd hear. <laughs> it's all about that tall hat. Um, so, well, if you walk into the Vatican, <laughs> it's covered in gold. Yeah. It's, that's, I, that's, I don't need to say more than that. Mm-hmm. Well, isn't there a connection between Egypt and the tall hat? Because didn't King Akhenaten <laughs> actually, according to some, have. A uh, the hat that showed power, and this was actually, um, from what I understand, was actually adopted by Catholicism in order to show the supreme power within the church. Have you ever noticed that all authority, even in America in the 1900s, mm-hmm. or on the Monopoly game, the the banker, tall, uh, hat? tall hats, yeah. you know that tall hat, the mitre. Uh, have you ever seen the fish? Like if you look at the Pope the right way when he's uh, wearing his mitre, that mm-hmm. hat is a fish hat. It's a much, much older pagan religion. Um, where are we going with this? I'm, I just well, I, I'm glad you brought you did the crossover between Christianity and paganism because I believe that oh, paganism the, the, is a lot older than Christianity, and Christianity yeah. started in order to you know do marketing against the pagans in order to get the more um, I was going to say subscribers, but the more parishioners <laughs> and and you know like the Christmas trees pagan, the Yule log yeah, pagan, yeah. you know there's so many pagan rituals within you know, within really, Christianity. The important thing about that, Rob, is that um, the pagan things and very much the point I'm making about ancient Egypt, those pagan things weren't chosen for frivolousness or as an excuse to buy gifts for people. The pagan holidays marked actual. Um, points like yes. high noon on your watch they mark these celestially mm-hmm. important events and then later uh, there was this kind of imposition on them of you know let's make them christian holidays so astarte you know which became easter became yep. all about the resurrection but in fact it was this pagan thing and it was it's supposed to take place on this very specific astrological night and you know the solstices and the equinoxes and it, it's just it, it is to my it speaks to my point that um there is actually a science that's been mistranslated and i couldn't say whether it was intentional or not but um but anyway, to your point, I love the big head idea. Akhenaten was unique. Akhenaten and his children yes. had this um, the shape of skull. skull. Yeah. You know that word homo capensis? Uh, no, but I think I ran into him in a bar once downtown Hamilton. <laughs> I used to live in West Hollywood. Anyway, um, 
there's a look it up homo capensis c-a-p-e-n-s-i-s and i'm not saying i mean i certainly didn't author this idea but there is an actual medical name for a, a species or a type of person that has this skull and it's a very known thing and um if you look it up there's a lot of people and some of them are a little too zealous about mm-hmm. this but it's an interesting idea that uh there's been this other species living with us and they tend to assume power positions and and also there was something about Akhenaten that was so hated by the rest of egypt that they tried to erase his name forever and it was only because of some prominent temple that fell over and there's a whole funny story they diverted the nile some roman um diverted the nile to wash off a temple and all they did was knock the temple well, over. well didn't they try to get rid of him because you know there were so many gods that the priests used to have then all of a sudden knock not and comes up and he says no 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 guys uh-uh. yeah. one god the well, rock. that would be like us trying to end the Fed. What he did was get in a fight with the power structure in Egypt, and he did yeah. try and consolidate all the gods into just the sun. Yeah. There were some other things about him. Uh, in the Persian culture, homosexuality is not looked upon favorably. And back then, mm-hmm. um, this is a whole weird conversation to get into, but there's lots of reasons. He had a strange relationship with his mother, and he married his sister, just this crazy stuff. Elvis and reincarnated. Did... There you go. What's that? Elvis reincarnated. <laughs> yeah. or um if you ever watch that show queer eye for the straight guy the no. first thing that happens on the show is they come in and adjust your art direction you know which is what he did <laughs> all of egypt was consistent aesthetically until akhenaten came in and he not only changed the gods but he changed the style of art wow. and there was such a robust and meticulous and rigorous system of communication through the art canons and that's why right. egyptian art didn't change for four or five thousand years and then akhenaten came along and the whole thing became much more flowy and beautiful and it's literally like the post Akhenaten era of Egyptian art. And so for a number of reasons, everyone hated him. And King Tut, as you know, didn't fare very well. The minute his parents died, he got clubbed to death and and they restored everything back to the way Mm -hmm. it was. Uh, So after 5,000 years of continuity. But anyway, so that is all interesting peripherally about Akhenaten. But he did seem to have this weird misshapen head and his children did. And there's lots of busts and statues of them. Uh, Also, he was an androgyne. He always portrayed himself with feminine hips and child bearing business below all right we'll talk more about Akhenaten on the other side of this break as we go to the news you know kind of sounds a lot like what's going on in the United States right now you know you've got this president who's trying to drain the swamp and well that's another story for another show this is the X-Zone and Chance Gardner is our very special guest this hour visit his website www.magicalegypt.com magicalegypt.com I'll be back on the other side of this break with the news. Don't go away. Chance Gardner is my special guest at this hour, Exxon Nation. His website is MagicalEgypt.com. Uh, Chance, we were talking about uh, navigating the afterlife. We've been talking about your your uh, series, Magical Egypt. Um, I have to ask you this because we 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 deal with ancient astronauts and so on. I've had Von Donneken on the show. I hosted a, a, a lecture seminar exhibition in St. Catharines going back to 1997, I believe it was, and Von Donneken came over, and I know Sukalakis when he was a little more sane than he is right now. Um, what is your take on the entire extraterrestrial connection when it comes to, to Egypt? Like... They want people to believe that the Egyptians did not have the experience to build the pyramids, that there was extraterrestrial um, intervention or assistance or know-how or engineering involved. I'm not at all opposed to the idea. And I have to say one of the first books I ever read as like a nine-year-old or something was um... – Chariots of the Gods. Cheers to the gods, yep. totally. And then that adaptation, I was so glued to that. Mm-hmm. Um, he's awesome, and he's iconic. I really have not seen anything that makes it absolutely certain. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you listen to him, the Nazca lines yeah. and the scale of the pyramids, and I don't know if you know Lloyd Pye, but there's oh, a definitely, I, I knew Lloyd very. I, oh. I knew Lloyd very well before he passed away. 
See, Lloyd is a careful, responsible scientist. I know a lot of people that are in theater, that are in yeah. writing, and I know a lot of people that just are in this industry and just are fantastic at making stuff up. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, I'm not going to say any names. But anyway, uh, Von Duncan, I loved that book. There's a, there's some factual things that he's just been proven absolutely wrong about. He was a little lax in his research in some cases, and embarrassingly, a lot of that went into ancient aliens. So there's some just provable, incorrect facts. But that being said, I, I love that idea, and it would explain so much mm-hmm. if that were the case and there's some things around egypt that really make you wonder there's lots of hovering boats and traveling through the stars and there's some stuff you know napta playa points to the three stars on orion's belt and actually yeah. tells you how far away they are mm-hmm. so i wouldn't at all be surprised i don't want to hang my hat on that and say that's the only possible thing and i really do i would like to believe that humans were smart enough that we could have done this ourselves exactly. but if it did happen and as lloyd pie pointed out you can look at our dna and you can see that it's been manipulated we have a, a different number of uh, chromosomes than everyone else our last two are fused together so in everyone's dna there's kind of a smoking gun that something's happened to our dna that was uh, artificial and modified but you know the essence of science one of the things i'm not talking about the show enough one of the things that i'm trying to get across in the show is there's this just time honored method of rational scientific inquiry that was put out by Rene Descartes. And it's very clear when someone's a scientist or when someone's a theorist. And right now, the alien thing is the most interesting theory in the world, but no one's come across with anything other than circumstantial evidence. And so you see the uh, Nazca lines and you say, well, I think that's aliens. But so I can't honestly say it passes the rigorous scientific um, you know, credibility measure, but I love the idea and I hope it's true. And I do want to do future episodes on, first of all, finding out how correct Zechariah Sitchin and his writing is. Because if, if that turns out to be a correct interpretation, mm-hmm. you know, there's like 300,000 of those clay tablets in the British Museum, and they all talk about, if Zechariah is correct, they all talk about aliens coming to, uh, coming to Earth, but then everyone else who speaks that language, and there's only seven people on Earth that read those old Akkadian things, everyone but Zechariah says he's wrong. Yeah. So I don't know enough about it to have looked into it, and what we're trying to do with Magical Egypt is stick with what's, there's so much that's actually scientifically provable, I don't need to lapse, I don't need to blow dry my hair straight up like what's his name does like i'm hanging upside down when I'm actually doing actually i think it's from uh, testing batteries with his tongue and i mean the car batteries <laughs> that'll do it yeah. you forget who your third grade teacher is if you do enough of that <laughs> you, start, you start losing little details from your past well, that explains a lot anyway what we, we tried to do there's these rules of science mm-hmm. and if it's repeatable if it's provable it's the difference between the science and the humanities is that nobody argues about math because it proves itself and there's so much in egypt that proves its own technology And so here's the most important thing, Rob. Honestly, the most important thing I feel like in Egypt is that there's all this stuff that is, you know, it's interesting and it's great conversation, but it doesn't pass the so what test. What's in it for me? What do I care if aliens ever came? I'm not so interested in where the technology came from. What I'm interested in is let's look at this technology because it tells you something about yourself. It tells you things about your consciousness and these timeless occult traditions that everyone laughs at or everyone, you know, everyone says, oh, you're, you're doomed to hell if you even look into this stuff there's this robust science that has been mislabeled as occultism but it's actually the science of exploring consciousness unfolding these weirder subtler aspects of consciousness that's usable it's not like you're reading about a violin that's picking up Mm -hmm. the violin and playing it um the masons have these terms operative and speculative so speculative stuff is great and it's fantastic entertainment i'm utterly disinterested in that because i want to stick with the stuff that actually speaks to people there's temples that tell you about you it's like a magic mirror that they hold up and it allows you to understand these parts of yourself that you can't view directly and they tell you very specifically here's how you achieve this intelligence that we achieved so to me it's less about where it came from and more about this is like finding a crashed ufo and let's reverse engineer it and let's make kevlar and let's make fiber optics and these are usable technologies that are there for us about ourselves yeah it's it's funny because um it's the Catholic Church and Christianity that actually make the the Egyptians out to be the bad guys. And the snake, the symbolism yeah, of the exactly. snake. You know, it's, 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 you know, I think that this would be a better world if religion, the ph- philosophical religions like Christianity, Judaism, were never brought to light. I think we'd be further ahead with our society, our culture, 
our learning and our knowledge. I think religions have held us back. It's just like a big dessert tray. You know, the dessert cart comes by mm -hmm. and certain people are going to uh, have sugary sweets and yeah. certain people are going to have a delicious grape. And it's up to the discerning mind to decide, you know, you're the only one that gets to decorate your inner garden. And the building blocks you use to build your psyche are all made up of your choices about what to expose yourself. And so I prefer let's um, find things that actually make it better. Let's find things that make me understand how to get to these places where, you know, there's all this stuff, intuition and empathy oh, and all these time. crazy things that we've learned. And that sounds superstitious or supernatural to mm -hmm. us now, but they're latent, dormant properties of consciousness. And when you see a civilization that's learned how to tap into these extended ranges of consciousness – and then they show you, here's some simple, um, something with your diet, something with sexuality, you know, mm -hmm. um, there's a whole tantric, one of the more interesting things that we found is this whole tantric and sex magic tradition that you find springing up in later occultism and very prominent in the East, tantra and kundalini traditions. They were all present, very sophisticated in Egypt, but all of Egypt passed through this Victorian filter of 18th century Englishmen and the idea of sex and sex magic and semen retention and all this stuff is just, it's so out there and it's so just flammably uh, taboo <laughs> and uh, what's that word when you say, oh, it's blasphemous. It's so burning, shining blasphemy to explore this stuff and it's just, it's about you and we've lived through the greatest Victorian hangover and this repression of sexuality and certainly sex has never been considered an important part of consciousness. It's certainly never been the doorway to higher consciousness. In the West, if you go to the East, this is very humdrum, pedantic, you know, so what? I know that already. <laughs> but in the West, we just don't acknowledge that. And there's just such a pressure to but once again, supplement. But you know? once again, it comes under the auspices of religion. I'm glad you're saying this. I, hey, I, listen, I, 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 I see it as I see it. You, that's that's uh, well. Look, that is the nature of good entertainment, and it's where entertainment stops being entertainment and it starts actually helping people. Because the one thing nobody ever gets after twenty years working at networks, I know that there's a certain type of nutrition that nobody gets, and it's just the plain truth. Exactly. You can eat McDonald's all day long, and you can starve to death because uh, all you want is a carrot or something with actual nutrition in it. And that's the difference between those, you know, the shows where people sit around and make up campfire stories, and uh, they're very good, very entertaining, but they're just made up campfire stories, versus is what um, you know? What a, a, the different tact? People like John Anthony West and Robert Shock and Robert Bavall and Graham Hancock Yo, really no, trying yeah. to stick to this tether of provable scientific truth, and that's where the real yield is going to come from. And that's what we've we've really narrowed our focus in Magical Egypt to this. This just this whole new thing that's emerging because, as you know, that whole subject of Egypt is just it's like a, a, a skeleton in the desert mm -hmm. with all the meat picked off of it and. And then there's the overt stuff that everyone harps on, but there's this whole unexplored thing, the traditions of magic and sorcery and sex magic and this, you know, Kundalini, the snake that comes out of the third eye. It's the most iconic thing you see in Egypt, this snake coming out of the third eye. And that's um, that's Kundalini. It's tantric uh, sex magic. And it's a kind of yoga. It's not really anything occult mm -hmm. or horrible, but there's just this giant thing that you don't know about yourself <laughs> that if someone were to show you, your life would change and you'd probably never get invited back to the church. I'm just trying. I, 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 something in my mind when you said the the snake in the third eye wasn't there, or isn't there a statue, or or wasn't there somebody in Egypt's history who had a band or a crown with a snake coming out of the forehead? Every one of them. Look up ah. Google Egyptian statues, and every it's the most iconic thing in Egypt. Okay. You, you're hard pressed to find one a statue or a relief that doesn't have the snake coming out of the head. And Egyptology won't address it. They say it's not Kundalini. It's this obvious thing because if you know symbolism, the exact same symbolism happens in India and in the Buddhist traditions. And it is the the symbol of Kundalini. You've risen this energetic snake, and it's come out your third eye, and that means that you're a realized person and active magician, and that you've you know you've mastered this psychosexual circuitry all right that makes you an emergent person all right stand by chance you and i have to take our final break exxon nation our guest this hour is a chance gardener his website is magicalegypt.com and chance and i will be back on the other side of this break as we wrap up this hour here in the exxon with yours truly from our broadcast center and studios in hamilton ontario canada my name is rob mcconnell don't go away
Chance Gardner is our special guest of this hour, Exonation, www.magicalegypt.com. First of all, Chance, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. I wish you continued success. And um, what has been the most pinnacle part of your career as the, as, as the documentarian of Magical Egypt? What has been the highlight so far? I have to say, early on, I found somebody who literally changed the trajectory of my life, changed my thinking. And as an artist, I shouldn't have any relationship at all to ancient Egypt. But mm -hmm. seeing it through the eyes of John Anthony West uh, showed me that, first of all, the authorities aren't entirely to be uh, taken at their word. Not that there's anything nefarious about them, but everyone who goes to Egypt and brings whatever specialty with them, Egypt speaks to you in your native tongue. So as an artist, I went and Egypt spoke to me through the art. And I realized something in the last 15 years, our research group that was behind the new series, by looking at the art and completely saying, okay, we know what Egyptology has to say, but what about the rest? What about everybody else? This little insular branch of the humanities why do they get the final say mm -hmm. let's hear what the engineers have to say let's hear what mathematicians have to say let's hear what the artists have to say as i started researching this i've made a number of discoveries that nobody else has found out but there's places where the architecture makes this perfect schematic of brain parts that are specifically the brain parts involved in consciousness and so for me as an artist, to see an entire culture that had married art and aesthetics and used art and aesthetics to transmit this fantastically sophisticated science, that really changed me because I didn't even understand the point of art and the role of art in society has changed so dramatically. Art used to be a technology that would teach you about yourself in a metaphysical way, and that's been robbed. Now art is advertising, which is literally the opposite of teaching you the truth and literally the opposite of helping you explore what your natural will is and what your natural state is. It's all about perverting your natural state so that you buy more products. And so not only did I learn that humanity has suffered this great shift from sort of a right hemisphere mode of consciousness to a left hemisphere mode of consciousness. But art itself has been so debased that it's lost its power in the world. And the artist, of course, is irrelevant now because art has been perverted. And if we go back far enough, there was this perfect marriage of art and science that energizes me as an artist, as a public communicator. And it's the secret behind timeless masterpieces. Every artist should look into transmitting these ideas and your art will be a masterpiece and it will stand the test of time. How did the Egyptians uh, feel about you doing your Magical Egypt uh, series? They love the idea that someone, you know, because I'm saying what they say. Egyptology right. notoriously ignores what they say about themselves, that I'm, I'm actually giving voice to what they say about themselves. And so I, I, I assume they like it. I've spent a lot of time over there. and Nobody's ever thrown rocks at me or spit on me. What would you like to share with the world right now about Egypt and how significant Egypt is and why we should learn more about Egypt? There are some remarkable groups and segments of society. There are esoteric brotherhoods, there are fraternal organizations, there are secret societies. There are out and out occult and magical uh, organizations and the secret of ancient Egypt is not a secret. These places, you can go into Masonic, any Masonic chapter, yep. and you can learn more about ancient Egypt and more about magic and more about your consciousness than you'll ever learn reading a million books from Orthodox Egyptology. There's a reason why the most secretive, but also the most intelligent, the most powerful, the most prolific, uh, and the most accomplished segments of society are that, because there's this secret stream of knowledge that is so empowering that as we've discussed, different power centers really don't like the idea of the common man being in possession of this kind of weird mental technology. And so I've learned that the world we live in is this entire duck blind to keep us from knowing the most important things about ourselves. And, you know, like um, if you knew how to fly, but nobody ever told you and they wouldn't let anything on TV that would suggest to you that you knew how to fly. <laughs> in a couple of generations, you've forgotten that you had that ability. And uh, that's what is most important to me that there are things about ourselves that we don't know that we used to know and they're very explicitly laid out if you look at the art and you look at the math and if you look at the geometry that's expressed in Egypt and the schematics and if you don't 
if you don't listen to the orthodox model and if you just look for yourself from the perspective of the sciences, then you'll see a very different place. And it's relevant to us. It's not just how many needle, uh, angels are dancing on the head of a pin. This is the most important information there is. And perhaps that's why uh, there's this institutional resistance to letting people know about it. One of the episodes in your series, uh, Magical Egypt, is the old kingdom and the still older kingdom. Tell us about that. The earliest things in dynastic Egypt, if you go and you spend time on the ground there, mm -hmm. all of dynastic Egypt was built on top of something that was vastly older. If you know about the way that rock decays over the ages, the reason that geologists are so much more important than Egyptologists in this regard, you see the Great Pyramid is built on something. The base of the Great Pyramid was there for thousands of years before the Great Pyramid was built. Um, the Sphinx, next to the Sphinx, there's a thing called the Valley Temple that is so old that it looks more like Stonehenge than anything in Egypt. And there's no hieroglyphs. And there's another Stonehenge in Egypt. It's a square Stonehenge, but it's massive. It's like every stone is as big as my house. And um, it's just – it's all there. It's all easy to see. And clearly the oldest things in Egypt were built on top of something that was thousands, let's say thousands, easily possibly 100,000 years older. <laughs> But all of Egypt, as we know, regular history tells us that's kind of when society, when civilization began. But when you actually go, everything there is overbuilt. And it happens a lot in, in India and in Italy, you know, the city of Pompeii. Mm -hmm. They dug out Pompeii and then they kept digging and they realized under Pompeii there's a much older city with much bigger stones that nobody even knows what to say about it. They call it Cyclopean. There's Cyclopean architecture all over the world. It's vast and huge. And it is more, if anything, if I could just say aesthetically, it seems alien because it doesn't have any writing and none of the characteristic Egyptian stuff, but the scale and the perfection. And if you um, – one of the new additions to Magical Egypt is Christopher Dunn, this amazing engineer who does yeah, all of these tests. Yeah. Yeah, he's awesome. Yes. Um, there's just all of this new proof from fields outside of Egyptology that there was a sophistication of technology that we just can't explain. And that technology seemed to have come from before Egypt rather than just someplace else concurrent with Egypt. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Robert Boval. He's been on the show. Graham Hancock, he's been on the show. Uh, Christopher Dunn, he's been on the show. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin's been on the show but before he passed away. Lloyd Pye was on the show a number of times. You see, prior to, to, to uh, Star Child, Lloyd used to be a Bigfoot expert. Wow. Yeah, and, you know, he was very well-versed in Bigfoot, and then he came across Star Child. And uh, from there on, he is, his expertise was brought over to the Star Child Project, and, uh, and he is sorely missed. He spent his own money. It was yeah. like 80 large or something to get a DNA test on that star child skull. And then exactly. he died. I don't want to say. I don't want to go into a conspiracy rabbit hole. But he died right when he had this genetic proof that this thing wasn't human. It seems that's always the way. You just get to a certain point and then something happens. I just invented a car that runs on water. Let's see how long I live. Mm. Interesting. You no, you know, that's a very common story, though, yeah. that anybody who gives free power or electric cars yeah. that run on water, they don't last more than a couple of months after they announce that. Yeah, I, I, I've heard that many times. Mind you, I solved the great mystery about how Jesus walked across the water. He uh, knew, yeah, he knew where the rocks were. <laughs> you know, I believe that there's always a logical explanation for anything that we can't understand at first. And, and, and yet, I, I believe that, you know, Fact is stranger than fiction. It's more exciting. You, you don't have to make, you know, there's so much unknown yet yeah. in this great planet of ours. And it's through it's shows true. like yours that more people will have their eyes opened and more questions will be asked. And I think that's what, as, as a filmmaker and as a documentarian, that is exactly what you want to do is get people asking those important questions based on the information that you bring them. Yeah. One of the most interesting ideas that I've come across in a long time is there's this idea that Plato used to talk about called the anamnesis. And if the premise is true that you have actually lived a succession of lives, you have this sort of – you have this just banks and pods of memories. 
And when you look at art or when you hear something that's true, mm -hmm. most people, if you're a higher functioning person, you had just automatically go, oh, yeah, that's true. And Plato's idea and the idea of anamnesis is that you never learn anything new, but you recognize true things from previous lives that you've learned at great expense, what's true and what's not true. And so this idea of anamnesis happens when you fall in love at first sight or when you hear a song and you instantly love it. You're remembering something from one of your previous incarnations. Um, I started playing guitar and I just I connected to this whole lifetime I, I have not earned what i what i do but i just tapped into this whole body of knowledge that i seem to have had from a previous lifetime that you know related to music and stuff and as i started studying this more it's the reason why people have such a weird relationship to ancient egypt because if there is anything to the idea of previous lives we've all spent some time in ancient egypt there's no missing that five thousand year window and so one in ten people and it happens to be weirdly enough all the people with the highest iq all the people on the right side of the bell-shaped curve have this weird on reasonable like fascination with egypt and i believe it's not a fascination as much as a recognition and a remembering of previous lives and uh, that's why it's so special and that's why unless you address the occult aspect of ancient egypt you're not really looking at egypt and you're ignoring the thing that makes it all operative and actually applicable to us chance i want to thank you ever so much for joining us a great hour i wish you continued success and exxon nation do yourself a favor visit www.magicalegypt.com. Take care, Chance. You too. Thanks a lot. My great pleasure. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the X-Zone with yours truly, Rob McConnell, from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget, on Simul TV, the X-Zone TV channel number 21, and for all our programming on the X-Zone broadcast network, radio side, xzbn.net. Don't go away. <laughs>